America today, we are living a paradox. We talk all the time about how important it is to get freedom for everybody. And I think myself that we are quite honestly trying to achieve this ideal. And yet at the same time, we are forever persuading ourselves that we are by nature not free. The psychologist tells us that we are merely the victims of our heredity and an environment or puppets directed by the unconscious forces within us. The sociologist says that we and our values are wholly sociologically conditioned. And the advertisers try their best to make us want what they think we should want and to hold that what they tell us is important to have, is important to have, regardless of what we ourselves might choose. And this satanic trio, as the existentialist would call them, Madison Avenue, the sociologist, the psychologist, have persuaded many of us that we really are not free. And you will hear people arguing very vehemently that they are not free agents. The existentialist will have none of this. They maintain that man is free and that he ought to be free. But when they say that he is free and ought to be free, they are not uttering a paradox. For they believe that it is only when man recognizes psychologically his freedom that he is in a position to fight for political freedom. And they think that freedom from oppression is something which man ought to have, but that only when he is free will he work for it. This message was stated very early in a play of Jean Paul Sartre's The Flies. In the scene there, Zeus is talking to Aegisthus, warning him that he ought to kill Orestes and his sister before they manage to kill him in vengeance for his having murdered their father. Aegisthus, my creature and my mortal brother, for the sake of the order that we both serve, I ask you, nay, I command you to lay hands on Orestes and his sister. Are they so dangerous? Orestes knows that he is free. He knows he is free. Then to lay hands on him, to put irons on him is not enough. One free man in a city is like a plague spot. You will infect my whole kingdom and bring my work to nothing. Almighty Zeus, why stay your hand? Why not fell him with a thunderbolt? <laughs> fell him with a thunderbolt. Aegisthus, the gods have a secret. Yes. Once freedom has kindled its beacon in a man's heart, the gods are powerless against him. It is between men and men. It is for other men to decide, and for them only, whether to let a man go his gait, or to throttle him. Zeus says that the man who knows he is free may prevail against heaven itself. But is there any psychology to support such a theory? Certainly not the behaviorists with its theory that man is an almost automatic system of stimuli and response, and not the Freudian doctrine either. But existential psychology does support the idea that man is free. Sartre, in his existential psychoanalysis, follows the general belief that freedom is a, not a proposition to be proved but a fact to be experienced. And he appeals to our own experience in the present. We all know, or at least we've read in novels about, those sudden shifts in orientation. Everything from the kind of thing that happens in the religious conversion to a simple reorientation of our loves and hates, our attitudes toward the people around us, toward our patterns in life. We do, as a matter of actual fact, make a new choice of ourselves from one time to another. Or, to use Sartre again, 
You may all remember some time when you stood over a precipice and you remember that vertiginous appeal from the depths below, almost compelling you to throw yourself over. And what's so horrifying about that experience is not the fear of falling, but the realization that nothing prevents you from going over. You could suddenly, despite everything in your past, give in and just go. Naturally, the determinist says that this is all an illusion, that in reality your decision to go over or not is caused. But what about this cause? Does it come from the past? The determinist always views the past as if he were a historian. It's very easy, since things have happened as they did happen, to look back and pick out the connections and the patterns. But this is to evade the real question, for the real question is to whether these patterns, these connections, had to be what they were, or whether they might just as well have been something else. If the determinist is to be absolutely convincing, he must predict the future, and I know of no determinist who has pretended to do so. I think, in reality, we have two meanings when we speak of the past, and we don't always keep them separate. First, there is the past of our objective acts and events, and in this sense, the past was what it was, and it will never change. But there is another sense and that is that the past influences us. And when we say that the past influences us, what we are doing is saying, my past is such and such. We are talking now about the meaning of the past. And this is something which we are constantly remaking every moment of our lives. If at the age of 18 I was guilty of some shameful act, or for that matter, if I had a religious experience. It was what it was, but what is it now? Is it a determining force in my life, or do I regard it all as a momentary aberration? Do I refuse to look at it and involve myself in self-deception? Or do I say, this was the real me, and I'll always be that me? Only I can decide. The same thing happens if we look at environment. We talk about being influenced by our environment. Well, let's take an example. Suppose you're born in a small town. There are many choices open to you. To take the simplest, you can either conform so absolutely to the mores of your small town that you become the very biggest frog in this little puddle, or you can make it an excuse. What chance have I had stuck in a place like this? Or you can make it your reason for working every bit as hard as you can and get to New York or Paris and start a new life. The same thing happens no matter what phase of our lives we're looking at. If our parents were over strict, okay. Do we become what they tried to make us? Do we revolt hostily and perhaps foolishly, destructively? Or do we take our background as a challenge to work out something new, which we can justify even before our parents' assurance? And even if it's a matter of a physical handicap, suppose I have only one arm. Am I going to show I can be an athlete despite all? Or will I try to make myself something else? Now one might say, okay, I'll go so far, but this is to assume that man is always rational and conscious. But are there not unconscious influences? What of the whole Freudian school? Here the existentialist takes a firm stand he declares that the doctrine of an unconscious, capital U, is either a falsification or a device in bad faith. There is an illuminating scene about this in the Mandarins. Anne, herself a psychoanalyst, is talking with Paula, who had retreated far and further and farther from reality until she finally had to go to a psychiatric clinic. They are talking about her so-called cure. Are you sorry things have changed? That would be saying too much. But you can't imagine how rich the world was in those days. The least little thing had a thousand facets. I would have questioned myself about the red in your dress. That man over there I would have taken to be a dozen different people all at once. 
And now the world seems rather flat to you. Not at all. I'm glad to have had that experience behind me. And I can assure you my life isn't going to be flat. I'm crawling with plans. Well, tell me about them, Paula. I have decided to become famous. I want to go out, travel, meet people. I want love and glory. I want to live. Are you thinking of singing or writing? Writing. A book in which I'm going to tell about myself. I've given it a lot of thought. It won't be an amusing story, but I believe it'll create quite a sensation. Are you planning on fictionalizing it, or are you going to tell it as it really is? Right now, I haven't decided on a form. It wasn't easy what I went through, but if you only knew how happy I am to have finally found myself. You must have been through some pretty bad moments, Paula. Yes, indeed. There were days when everything seemed so funny, I almost died laughing. But other days were pure horror. They had to put me in a straitjacket. Well, Dr. Mardris is good, isn't he? Oh, he's wonderful. It's extraordinary with what certainty he found the key to the whole story. Although I must admit, I didn't offer much resistance. Is the analysis over? Mm, not completely. The main part is done. I never told you about my brother, did I? Never. I didn't even know you had a brother. He died when he was 15 months old. I was four. It's easy to understand how my love for Henri immediately took on a pathological character. Henri was also two or three years younger than you, wasn't he? Exactly. That explains my... Well, my childish jealousy gave rise to a feeling of guilt, which explains my masochism in connection with Henri. I made myself a slave to that man. I gave up all personal success for him. I chose obscurity, dependence, and why? To redeem myself so that through him, my dead brother would eventually consent to absolve me. Huh. Well, I think I made a hero of that man, a saint. Sometimes I could burst out laughing just thinking about it. Have you seen him again? Oh no, I won't see him again. He took unfair advantage of the situation. I'm quite familiar with the kind of explanations Dr. Madras has used. Yet to release Paula, it was necessary to reach back into the past in order to destroy her love. But I think those microbes which can't be exterminated except by destroying the organism they are devouring. Henri's dead for Paula, but she's dead too. I don't know that fat woman with the sweaty face and the bovine eyes who's swilling scotch beside me. Anne is a very unconventional psychoanalyst. And obviously de Beauvoir has set up this scene to satirize the belief of the Freudians. There are many things here which we could comment on. For example, the new cured and adjusted Paula. Is she any better really than the earlier Paula who had had her hallucinations? But the chief thing which is involved here is this, the attack on the idea of the Oedipus complex as something which can be used to explain anybody at all, or if not the Oedipus complex, at least childhood experiences, which have been forgotten and yet somehow determine us. And always, of course, the determinism is in terms of the unconscious. In Paula's case, we can see how ludicrous it all is. Somehow or other, the idea that this brother, whom she had not thought enough of consciously, even to have mentioned him, has unconsciously been dictating her whole adult life. We somehow don't believe it. But before blaming Paula too much, we should ask ourselves just how much of the modern world does live by the belief in the unconscious. Sometimes I wonder if people could do without the unconscious with any less difficulty than without the concept of God. It's such an alluring thing. It's so easy to say, well, my childhood experiences have undoubtedly made me this way. There's not much I can do about it. I, I don't really understand why I do the strange things that I do, but this is the way people are. There is a real me somewhere there down in the mysterious depths, and I can't find this me, but it's there directing my conduct. It's a very alluring way of avoiding the responsibility of doing something about ourselves and changing. Sartre feels and says that the concept of the unconscious is absolutely incorrect because it escapes 
the realization of what consciousness itself actually is. The personality is not, he says, as Freud would have it, like a many structured building where we can start at the top and go deeper and deeper down until finally we end up finding real truth somewhere there in the depths of the cellar. Instead, consciousness for the existentialist is simply a process whereby we relate ourselves to the outside world. Immediately, someone may ask, but this is nonsense, isn't it? Uh, how can I possibly say that all of me is conscious? When I forget things, when I suddenly have things drawn to my attention I hadn't known before, and new insights, this kind of thing. Well, of course, Sartre allows for levels of awareness. He argues that we do decide which parts of our experience we are going to make into our lives, which parts of our past we are going to remember, and how we are going to remember them, and what significance we're going to attach to them. This is all a matter of reflective consciousness and non-reflective consciousness, a matter of whether we concentrate on certain things or deliberately avoid seeing them. But never at any time, he tells us, are we determined by something which we could not, if we tried, grasp and understand. Sartre is naturally not the only existential psychologist. There are many in Europe and in America. Perhaps the movement of existential psychology in America is the most important aspect of existentialism here right now. The existentialists are not all alike in this field. They are too much individuals. But they do agree that the significant thing about man is not those traits and instincts which he might share with the animals, with the famous white rats of the laboratory, for instance. It's the distinctively human qualities of a being who has in him somewhere a wellspring of freedom to decide what he will make of himself, a being who knows he will die, and who can raise questions about why he is here. All of these existential psychologists feel that there is such a thing as over-adjustment, and that man should find himself not by adjusting to his society, but by learning to value his own free uniqueness. Of course, there is another difficult question here. If we even say such a thing as existential psychiatrist, are we not implying that there is mental illness? And if there's mental illness, we can hardly deny that there is, then how can we speak of freedom? If a person has retreated from reality, apparently completely, can we say he's free in any sense at all? We might look at it this way. We recognize, of course, that there's more than one type of mental affliction. If a person has suffered actual brain damage, to the point where we would hardly say that he is a human being any longer, then to the degree that he is not a human being, he is not free. But so long as he is human, he is free. But the vast majority of mental illnesses are not caused by brain damage. And here I think we have a parallel with hypnosis. If a person is under hypnosis, he is subject to another's will. But a person can't be hypnotized against his will. And when he's in hypnosis, it is because he has, as it were, willed to put himself under another's will. The existentialists say that in mental retreats also, the patient has willed to escape from reality. Both the quality of what he does and the mere fact that he has escaped depends upon his having refused reality. Sartre has an extremely interesting play that deals with this subject, The Condemned of Altona. Here, as in The Flies, the themes of personal freedom and responsibility and guilt are mingled with the political. Its hero, Franz, had retreated at the end of the war, war in Germany because he had practiced torture and he felt that he could no longer justify the torture since his country had been defeated. The end was no longer justifying the means. His sister Lainey is encouraging him in his delusion as he sits in his oyster shell filled room giving messages to the 30th century, the crabs before whom he thinks he is a defense for the 20th century.
I'm discovering the horrible truth. We're under observation all the time. We are? You, me, all the dead. Mankind. <laughs> Be on your guard. They're watching you. <laughs> Laugh while you can, my lady. The 30th century will arrive like a thief in the night, and you'll find yourself in the middle of them. What if we are already there? Where? In the 30th century. <laughs> be on your guard. If the crabs are watching, you can be sure they'll find us very ugly. How do you know? Crabs like crabs, it's only natural. Suppose they were men. In the 30th century? If there is a man left, he'll be preserved in a museum. And will the crabs do that? Yes. They'll have different bodies and therefore different ideas. What ideas, huh? What? Can you grasp the importance of my task? The exceptional difficulty? I'm defending you before judges I haven't the pleasure of knowing. Working blind. You drop a word here to the judgment, it tumbles down the centuries. What will it mean up there? Do you know sometimes I say white when I mean to say black? Good God. They want to sap my morale. Yes, they do. Bad move. My morale is like steel. <laughs> my poor Franz. He'll do as he likes with you. Who? The representative of the occupation forces. <laughs> he'll knock at the door. You'll answer it. And do you know what he'll say? I don't give a damn. He'll say, you imagine you're the witness. But you're not. You're the accused. What will you reply? Get out. You're in their pay. You're the one who's trying to demoralize me. What will you reply? For 12 years now, you've been prostrating yourself before this tribunal of the future. And you've conceded them every right. Why not the right to condemn you? I'm a witness for the defense. Mm -hmm. Who appointed you? History. It has happened, hasn't it, that someone believed himself to be appointed by history? It turned out to be someone else? I won't let that happen. I'll put history into a mouse hole. <laughs> Shh. They're listening. You egg me on until I forget myself. I beg your pardon, listeners. My words have betrayed my thoughts. Challenge their confidence, please. That's your only weakness. Tell them they are not your judges. And then you'll have no one else to fear, neither in this world nor the next. Get out! I haven't finished cleaning up. Very well. I'm going to the 30th. You're looking at me. I forbid you to look at me. Will you take your eyes off me? I will if you'll speak to me. You're driving me mad. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Very well. Do you want to look at me? Then do so. Left, right, left. Stop. Right, left, right, left. Please, stop. Right. What's the matter, my beauty? Afraid of a soldier? I'm afraid of despising you. Lenny, don't leave me alone. Do you want me to stay? I need you, Lenny.
I doubt that it will be the crabs who judge us in the 30th century. But France is right in saying that we will be judged by the 30th century and by any century, so long as there are men alive to look upon our actions and to judge them. The psychology of freedom is a harsh, a pitiless, and almost a terrifying psychology, for it gives us absolutely nowhere to turn for excuse. We cannot blame our parents or our society. We cannot even take refuge in the idea that our mental afflictions have caused us to do what we have done, or that being an alcoholic is an excuse for our behavior, or that having any other kind of handicap has made it impossible for us to lead better lives. And this really puts man entirely on his own and alone. But it is a dignity which is involved here. Man has the burden of the whole world on his shoulders. And if he can change, then there is hope. It is determinism which is the hopeless thing, for it says there's no way out. Others have made us what we are and there's nothing we can do. The philosopher Kant said that our sense of moral duty implies the freedom of our will. I ought means that I can. The existentialists begin with the fact that I can change, but the choice as to whether or not I will change and how I will change rests with me alone, for I, and only I, am responsible for what I have done, I am responsible for what I am, and for what I shall freely choose to be. Seen from the Mandarins by Simone de Beauvoir, translated by Leonard M. Friedman, is published by the World Publishing Company. The scene from The Flies was translated by Stuart Gilbert. The scene from The Condemned of Altona was translated by Sylvia and George Leeson. Both plays by Jean-Paul Sartre are published by Alfred A. Knopf Incorporated. <laughs>